Madam Peers and a former colleague at Nation, uh, Karibu Sana. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this is a very important occasion for us, and um, as has been rightly indicated, I'm taking you through this session. Um, we have a number of panelists, very seasoned and distinguished practitioners in the media sector. So I know we are privileged uh, this morning. The focus of our discussion here is media sustainability and viability in Kenya. And we're coming from the context that um, we are at a crossroad. Media in Kenya and elsewhere in the world is going through turbulence. And the question all of us are now retreating to ask is, how do we move forward or how do we navigate this landscape? And that's why we have the various panelists. Statistically, if you look at what happens on the ground, in Kenya, for example, we've seen revenues of media houses declining by something up to 40%, if not half. We know of organizations which used to post very huge profits. Look at them today, things are very different. And in that context, therefore, each media house, each media institution is asking, how do you uh, survive? And this is what we want to discuss. Um, P.S. Fatma will give a keynote address, an overview, anchoring the conversation. Then we'll have the subsequent speakers coming in from different strands. Tachi Lotieno, who is the chair of the Disa Guild and a colleague at the Mid Nation Media House, is a specialist in digital media. And digital media has been the cause of the disruption in the media industry. So he'll be giving us a perspective on that. Then we have um, engineer, uh, engineer Kibuet from Communications Authority. He's in charge of licensing. As a regulator, he'll give us a perspective of what they see the future being and how media players can uh, work in that um, landscape. Then we have Rosemary. Rosemary is a distinguished media practitioner, having worked both in the media, in the civil society, now at Strathmore University. So she's bringing in a dimension from the development sector and from the university sector, and we see what we can do. So without much further ado, I want to ask Madam Fatma to come and give a keynote address. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is David Aduda. I work for Nation Media Group. I've been there for uh, more than 20 years. So I've seen the industry run through the turbulence, good times, bad times. Fatma was with me when we were having very, very good times. So Fatma Karibu. Thank you. Good morning again. Uh, for those who were there yesterday, uh, I, I was with you. Um, the panelists, Churchill uh, Otieno from Nation, uh, Engineer Borowet from CA, uh, David Adunda, of course, uh, who has just done his introductions, and Rosemary Okelo Orale, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'd like to say that. Uh, like the world over, the media is a very trusted institution in Kenya. The public often see the media as the source of truth and often believe in what they report. In view of this, people believe in the media to provide fair reporting uh, of the socioeconomic and political development in the country. Indeed, the Constitution provides for the right to media and the citizen to access information, especially when it is of national importance. The Constitution acknowledges the responsibility of the media to inform the public on matters that affect their lives. As the watchdog of the society, 
the media have a right to interrogate how government prioritize public projects and programs and their expenditure to establish whether they have positive impacts on the lives of citizens. The government surely does appreciate this role and it is for this reason that the government deploys public communications officers in all ministries and state agencies to facilitate flow of information from ministries to the media and the general public. The media is encouraged to utilize the Office of the Public Communications in MDAs as a source of government information. You will agree with me that the Kenyan media landscape is currently facing significant challenges, both in terms of structural arrangements and issues of professionalism, and I think Aduda alluded to that. The good times are over. Given the centrality of the media in society, both as a political and an economic, an economic, an econ an economic institution, competing interests have often created conflicts among the media stakeholders. Some of the challenges in the media industry arise out of media ownership driven by profit motive against public interest, political interest, and editorial policy, amongst others. In addition, during the electioneering period, professionalism of the media sometimes raises concern, especially how journalists prioritize issues of public interest. Similarly, occasional internal challenges experienced in some of the media houses during elections makes it difficult for them to fulfill their professional obligation on civic duty. In fact, during political campaigns, tensions often rise between the media and the government, a situation that can threaten press freedom and access to information. I'm glad that we are over that, at least for us, Zimbabwe can handle it for now. However, I'm happy that even with the challenges I have cited above, the topic at hand remains pertinent to me, especially as you've heard, I worked in the media industry as an insider, and a lot has happened in the industry, and the emerging challenges present new thinking to those in the business. But for a moment, we need to ask ourselves, how is the current media business environment in Kenya? Can we expect the sector to attract investors government returns and media practitioners. Like elsewhere around the world, the viability of the media industry in the developing countries, and Kenya in particular, face great challenges. With the, some words, with the proliferation of digital media and citizen journalism, there is need to re-examine the old business model for running media outlets in this 21st century. Media viability not only includes financial sustainability, that is economic survival, but also the ability of media outlets to produce high quality journalism in the long run. This means that the economic, social, and political conditions in a country must provide a supportive environment for the emergence, development, and continuance of media companies providing relevant content that informs the public, holds those in power to account, and enables participation and dialogue. It is important to recognize the importance of media viability, especially at a time when old media business models are coming under strain due to changes caused by new technological innovations and digital transformation in the media sector. Not much is known about the promotion of media sustainability in emerging markets such as Kenya. Several business models are applied in Kenya, and a thriving business industry has been witnessed over the past decade. Several media outlets have emerged over the period with some established outlets spreading their wings to the neighboring countries. Such models may rely on advertising, sponsorship, subscriptions, public funds, volunteer contributions, a combination of several of these or other new innovative ways. Despite the vibrancy in the sector, there are lots of challenges that impede the media from taking its strong central position as the fourth estate. For instance, it is common knowledge that many media outlets of this country are run like briefcase companies. Some operate from makeshift newsrooms with hardly any business plans and without vision for the future. Some of the private media outlets are unable to hire and retain journalists or pay attractive remunerations. This creates room for unethical practices that violate the code of conduct, ethics and standards, such as blackmail, extortion, 
concentration on coverage of conferences and seminars, such as this one, where they will be facilitate, facilitated with per diems. Such practices could jeopardize the cause of the profession and discourage qualified and experienced graduates. In the print media, the fact that libel and slander are still considered criminal offenses and were still punishable by a prison sentence is seen by many practitioners as a serious impediment to the role media plays in fighting corruption and abuse of office. Additionally, some journalists allege it is challenging for them to access some senior government officials for interviews compared to foreign or international media. Others claim that the state media receive preferential treatment compared to private media causing a strained relationship between media and government. I hope that this session will attempt to answer the following questions. Is media a viable business venture in Kenya? How can Kenyan media attract local and foreign investment? And how can media owners and practitioners position themselves to generate profit while at the same time safeguard the rights of the public to know the truth? Second question, what would be a balanced environment that protects media freedom and promotes a sustainable media sector in Kenya? And finally, how can media skills gaps in Kenya be bridged to enhance a responsible and professional media. I thank you. Thank you, Madam Pierce. She's really raised some fundamental issues. Among them, she's talked about the legal framework where we still have in our statutes, uh, criminal libel. She's talked about skills gaps. And this is a paradox in the sense that at this point in time, we have so many universities and tertiary institutions offering training in journalism, but still we have skills gap. That in itself is a contradiction of sorts. She's talked of the economic environment. And this first in terms of um, how viable is media as a business? So that if you're told you're given some um, large sums of money, would you go in to media business or you can start a retail shop? So we're asking, is it a business you can put in your money into? Thirdly, she talked about the digital, um, the digital issues we have the uh, digital migration, the digital innovations, and the e-economy. How have they impacted on the practice of journalism and also the business of journalism? She's also talked about ethical issues and an allusion she's made that um, we often try to crowd, we often crowd conferences rather than going out to do stories because at the conferences there would be travel and uh, night outs. So the question of ethical practice in journalism is coming to uh, bear with us and this is something is that we need to uh, interrogate. Now I want to ask Rosemary Okello, who currently is the director of Africa Media Hub at Southern Business School to come and start conversing these issues and put them in context. Rosemary. Thank you, David. Uh, Madam Pierce, it's uh, our honor to have you with us, especially when you're talking about the future and sustainability of the media. My fellow panelists, um, all protocol observed. Um, today's discussion about the future of the media need us to think as um, uh, the media practitioners and to take stock internally, externally, and also in uh, what the ecosystem offer for us as uh, media practitioners. Looking back, how many of you remember the letter set days? How the newspapers used to be produced? You kept on putting alphabetical, you, there were some metals you, you needed to put together. How many of you remember? That's how far we've moved. How then you remember the reproductive days where you produced the film and the plates 
and then you take it to the press. Yeah? Do you remember? And then the typewriters with the A5, how many of you remember? Whereby you had five copies, and if it spiked, and I remember uh, Joseph Karimi could spike you are in the newsroom and could shout your name that you are a useless journalist. Do you remember that? <laughs> you see, that's how, because I said, we need to learn from the, back, from the past as we even move forward looking at the future. But looking at the future, that means that uh, when the peers say that has the media actually um, held its responsibility, the media is known for three things. The public watchdog, the agenda setter, and what? Development. When the NATO sat in, uh, in, in US in 1958 and they said, we are taking the independent Africans, what tool can we take? They said the media was going to be a, a tool. When we got independence, and we had KBC then as the broadcasting, it was seen that it was going to be a public media. And do you know the public media, what it means? that the government could invest in that public media in order for the people to actually eradicate literacy, empower the community, and create awareness of the development that was being done by the government at the key institution. So looking back many years later, you have seen that there's a lot of disruption. And this is what Dennis McQuill in 1981 refers to the decline of mass society, because the media has taken the mass market for granted both public and, and, and private. And um, Alvin Tolva also refers to as the massification of our society where we are splintered. So we talk of uh, uh, digital disruption. When technology came into space, when we started using computer as journalists, we needed to learn some basic uh, program in order to access uh, uh, computers. And computers was only by one person. And so now that even your young child can be able to access that information, that means that information is everywhere. But how does the media reshape itself? And this is where we say internally that the media houses should still not regard IT and, and internet as kind of for just other people and for technicians and journalists to be able to be able to just be to agitate what leaders have said. And then we need to actually invest in training our journalists to the next level, because uh, learning is continuous. So we have to make, as media houses, to sustain ourselves, because I'm going to show you a research that has been done by the Future Network uh, worldwide, that in uh, America, by 2018, newspaper will be distinct. You'll be seeing it. So are we as media houses planning on how to deal with external impact on our industry and how are we going to actually uh, uh, manage it? And then I'm going to show you that the upcoming thing is the data journalism. I'm glad Aga Khan is here, they're doing digital journalism. At Strathmore, we are actually doing data journalism in business reporting, finance and data journalism with Bloomberg in five universities in, in Africa. And that, that, that data journalism we've seen it's not only about journalists, it's about embedding in every core of the society. It's about how to tell the story using facts and figures and give those stories faces and make everyone inclusive that Wanjiko, who never used to be known, has a voice in those facts and figures. When you say that 80% 80, 80 of women in Northeastern are actually uh, are poor, this 80% of women I've got faces, 80% of women have got uh, voices, 80% of women have got experience. So as journalists, in order for, now I'm talking internally. Internally, newsroom uh, organization is not going to be the same. The news editor is not going to be the same. The data has disrupted the newsroom management because before I remember we could have, what you what call it, it was a black book where stories will be written. But stories are now emerging every single minute. So what the media needs to do is not to be reliant on the, to, on, on the, on the, on the social media, but to make what social media validate it with research information, with in-depth analysis, with uh, facts and figures that can add value to what the social media said. So we have to make choices. And make choices means that rather than passively wait for content to be delivered, as within the broadcast days, 
We need to, as users, seek out comparing media importance by using search engines and validate it. If we say in Kenya there's a, there's a break, or there's what we call heavy rains, how did other parts of the world experience it? We can validate it and create awareness and more experience. We have to create conversation, that's our internally. And the conversation I'm talking about is that the current media platforms has got various platform of conversation. We have Twitter, Facebook, among others. By the time we come here, this session has been discussed. How was it yesterday? What was it? You know, there's conversation. But out of that conversation, we can actually use these new tools to be able to create, gain importance of the information and summarize it. Curate. How then as users, as, because I'm talking this because as journalists we need to know how these things are being used. How can we uh, curate the information in a way that can be able to help consumer understand the information in a better way and write it and get feedback. And of course, collaborate. Many a times we don't collaborate as journalists when we go, and that's the, few, uh, the future we'll be talking about. We think that we are there to just uh, pick information and walk out. Collaboration is critical, saying I'm a journalist from the nation, and this war, you said this, I would like to get more information on this. How can I get, maybe it's a researcher, he said, by the way, we did research on this. Can you come? By that time, you can get further information and be able to inform your audience well. But as uh, media houses, we can't be crying that, uh, uh, that uh, the media is no longer the same, the disruption is affecting us, there's no profit. Netflix is making billions without investing a coin. And so how can we cry when Netflix and Facebook and the rest are making millions and yet we still stick into the old system? It's like we are still using the three stone way of cooking while people are using microwave and we are just saying we are not making profit. We need to also have, so we need to have what we call a social a platform like I challenge media houses here. How is your social platform? Is it regurgitating what you are also saying on the print and broadcasting? It has to be actually uh, 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 in touch with the people. It has to be speaking. And that's what um, Sisa Vienna University of uh, Georgia once said that through data journalism, the media can adapt and respond to the challenges in the information environment and be able to be interactive understands the, uh, the, the listeners or the readers' feelings, and through that storytelling, be able to engage, so that next time I want to watch it because you speak to my, my issue. And we have to know that uh, the world is not made of atoms, the world is made of stories. And those stories, how we put is what is going to be important. So media houses have never put training money to, in order to train they are journalists in the emerging trends. And this emerging trends is what affects them. So we can find, and uh, uh, Churchill, when he speaks here, is the only data journalism I've ever known for a long time, and then Dorothy Otieno, among others, who can be able to uh, a kind of um, mix content, uh, visualization, and even infographics, and tell a story that makes sense. Many of us, like now we are trying, uh, starting a course in September, sponsored by Bloomberg, you tell somebody that's technical, and yet data is, we walked here, we generated data. We speak, we generate data. Data is how you use those um, uh, facts and figures to tell more compounded stories. So I want to say that um, if we don't change the way we think, if we don't change the way we do uh, culture, right, if we don't transform our culture within the media houses, if also don't review our role as journalists, as an enabler, storyteller, and a, and, and a partner, not, because the fourth estate has been defined with a fifth estate kind of spectrum. And within the fifth estate, we have to see the alternatives. Within the fifth estate, there are diversity. Within the fifth estate, there are many channel mediums in which we tell our story. So the fourth estate, if we stick to the fourth estate that we are the society watchdog, how then will we are going to empower our society in order to make an impact using our story, then we are going to remain behind. And that's what, when I sat with the deputy uh, director of the New York Times, because I used to work uh, with Ford Foundation, and many a times I could engage with the New York Times, 
And when we are going through transition, they say we had to change the way we do our work. And by changing the way we do our work, we adapted the technology, and now data journalism is bringing 90% of our profits, we could have been closed now if we didn't change. So my challenge to you all, are you ready to change? And if you're not ready to change, let me show you in future how you're going to be distinct. They have not actually put Africa because there's no data around Africa and the newspaper. Though we said yesterday that, uh, how many newspapers do you have and broadcasting? And that's the future, the research that's been done, but all of you can take and start saying, when we reach this age, how are we going to reshape ourselves to be able to actually adjust to the society, to the ecosystem uh, uh, disruption? Second is how, uh, the second one is, are you able to get to the second slide? Go down. Yes. That's the newscape, how it looks like. And these are the methodology we need to adapt in order to be able to actually become uh, relevant. So if you don't, and you remember the integration becomes in the middle. And then the third, that's how you, we're going to make value added into our news, newspaper work. And with that, I want to say when you talk about data journalism, we think that it's about facts and figures but it's about getting somebody's emotions. I would like to just end with that so that you can be able to see. Sorry. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll leave this one so that you can take the researchers and the academias who are here can use it for their research the next time. So life brought by equity is about the water story. And when you wake up in the morning, you are thirsty. And when we report about water as media, how we say, oh, city council did this and this. And just look at how this story has been captured and tell me that if this story you are to be taken, given to you, does it connect your emotions, your intelligence, and your ways of looking at water differently? Thank you. Maybe they'll show that. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, can you get the lights on once more? <clears throat> um, she's given us a very, very uh, broad panorama of the situation in the media. And for us, it's a question of survival. Because if by 2018, the US newspapers are dying, we don't know when. You remember that sometimes we used to have special edition of newspapers. Do you remember those ones? When there's a big story, there would be a special edition. Do you see them anymore? That was the start of collapse of newspapers in Kenya. So it's not a long way from now. So I want to ask engineer Leo, Leo Boruet, who is the director of multimedia services at the Communications Authority of Kenya, to give us his perspective, and we see how the situation is. Remember that KBC has a big piece of land in Karen where they have some big masts. I'm not sure if those things are still working. But that tells you where we are going. Engineer, Karibu. OK, thank you very much, David. Uh, good morning. Is it afternoon, rather? It's afternoon. Thank you. Yeah, so for. It's not yet. Huh? Oh, it's still morning. Oh, okay. Yes. So basically, uh, I'm Mia for from Communication Authority of Kenya, and uh, from where we sit, I mean the issues really have come out very clearly. Uh, but uh, maybe for us, it could have been about opportunities rather than sustainability. Uh, our experience in the recent past has been starting with the digital migration we actually opened the space. And uh, as we speak now, we've got 60 TV stations. Uh, FM area also, we've got about 140 stations. Uh, and what we are saying is uh, we are looking at technology really as a enabler. And I think uh, some of the slides of uh, Rosemary uh, allude to that. And 
when you look at technology now, for journalists, when it, just from the old chain of value chain, from production, uh, distribution, that's delivery, even to reception, I mean, the smartphone penetration, I mean, there are alternatives now. So what we are saying is, as broadcasters, we encourage them to, to leverage, leverage on, on the existing uh, technologies, the emerging technologies, uh, because we understand and we have seen challenges in the industry. Uh, as David said, the revenues are really falling. But you are saying, even with that, we want to encourage you to leverage on the existing. The other thing we want to say is, from our side as regulators, we, we really more on the uh, playing field. So, for example, when it comes to public interest, we champion public interest in the programming code. And things to do with the protecting children in the watershed period, things to do with local content quotas, uh, things to do with the inclusivity, PWD, accessibility. And even as we champion those public interests, our approach usually is to be consultative. And in the past, we've engaged broadcasters so that even as we achieve the public interest, we enable them to budget and be able to accommodate the additional, uh, the additional obligations. For instance, in personal with disabilities, we've uh, achieved the issue of sign language in the news. But starting this year, we've already engaged broadcasters and we will be uh, increasing even to other programming. But we have an elaborate program which really... The other thing is in terms of licensing. We're also responsive. Uh, for example, beginning this year, we've matched some licenses. Uh, we used to give licenses for cable, satellite, and terrestrial separately. For us now, from CN now, that's one license because it's really about the content. It doesn't matter whether you use cable, we just give you one subscription license. The other thing is term of the license. It used to be five years for FM, uh, seven years for TV. Starting this year, we've increased it to 10. And that's a way of responding, responding to, to the challenges that are ongoing. Uh, the other thing is in terms of uh, there are some markets that are monopolistic in a way. Uh, when you look at the signal distributors, we've only two. And uh, if we leave it to them, they can charge anything for the platform. Uh, but what we have done is we do studies. And these studies are informed by the, the, both the BSDs and the broadcasters. So we get inputs from them. And uh, we did one in 2013. We did, one, we did another one in 2016. We'll be doing one in 2019. And progressively, the rates, like the last rates actually came to, they reduced by a third in some places, Nairobi, and even two thirds outside Nairobi. So, so we'll be looking at that. What we also want to say is the market, the broadcasting market is really still young in Kenya. And I think uh, we don't uh, really agree with the idea that uh, the market is difficult because we believe we are in a transition. We believe there will be mergers and acquisitions. We believe there will be alternatives. I don't know whether Kennedy is here, bloggers. Because really, going forward, it will really be, what is the information coming out? Is it information that can make Kenyans more responsible, more effective? It doesn't matter whether it's coming from the blogger, it's coming from mainstream media, it's coming from where. And that's why, I believe the market is still open. Uh, the other thing is uh, we want to encourage the broadcasters because we, we believe the mainstream media has an opportunity to distinguish themselves as credible. And you see, when it comes to ethical broadcasting and editorial independence, as, uh, that can only be played by you as journalists. We've got industry bodies, editors guild, We've got media council that deals with professionalism. And we believe that can really distinguish you from, because these days when you look at the bloggers, 
I think all journalists are bloggers. I don't know. That's my view. Bl all bloggers may not be journalists, but all journalists should be. If they are not, they should be. And that way, the standards will even, will even be raised. Uh, so I want to challenge the broadcasters in that end. From our end, we'll continue championing public interest. We'll continue consulting and being uh, responsive the way we've been responsive in terms of licensing and even in terms of competition issues, uh, the issue of where there is monopoly, like signal distributors. Uh, the other thing I want to encourage uh, broadcasters is in terms of associations, it's very important in this time to lobby. And uh, we've got uh, media owners association, we've got digital broadcast association. I think the area of FM is a bit not strong. And uh, if uh, they, are, they can, because you also depend on the producers. I think we, nobody talks so much about the, who produces the content. That is the independent producers, the news sources. I think that's an area that needs to be developed because it also informs your business because that's your, your input. So that's an area that needs to be looked at. And uh, I think with that really, if all of us play our part, uh, unfortunately some will pay the price. But I think the important thing really is, at the end of the day, do we get value from the spectrum we've given? Do we get value from the information available? So each party should really play. People like Strathmore will continue showing us the future. People like uh, Media Council and uh, Edda's Guild will set the standards. Us will make the field and the peers will, will guide us in terms of, of uh, policy. In terms of attracting investment, our policy is really very conducive in that because we give 30% min, min, minimum of 30% local. So you can still get 70% uh, from outside. And uh, the critical thing really is can you make yourself credible? Can you make yourself distinguished by editorial independence once we played our part in, uh, just uh, as regulators? Thank you. Thank you, engineer. At least you've told us what happens from the regulator's perspective and um, we are heartened to learn that from your point of view, all that we may see as disruption is indeed an opportunity. That there's still a landscape in which all of us can exist. So it depends on how and what we do to survive. Now I want to ask Chachi Lotieno, who wears the heart of chair of the Editors Guild, and significantly, he's one of the veterans in digital journalism. So I want to ask him to come and also give his perspective about, is about digital and is about ethics and skills for professionals in the industry. Churchill? Uh, Madam Pierce, fellow panelists, uh, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Greetings from the Kenya Editors Guild and greetings from uh, National Media Group. Do you receive them? Yes. Ah, thank you. Uh, three things I'd like to share with you. The first one for me, looking at this issue as an editor, uh, is very foundational and it's the whole question of who is a journalist at the end of the day. We sit here today at a time when almost everybody is able to write what essentially are stories. You could dispute their quality, but they can put out some text about events that have happened on their Facebook walls. They could, they could put out some pictures about happenings around themselves and they could put out some videos about the same. So I think we must ask ourselves whether 
journalism is defined by the skills that we need to do it? Or do we need to go more, to go further? I want to propose that a time has come when those of us in industry, but more importantly those of us in the training schools, must define journalism from an ethical point of view. So that what makes me a journalist is not the fact that I can write well or do good radio or appear well on, uh, on the TV screens, but it must be my fidelity to the ethical groundings, the values that govern the practice of journalism. I say that because at a time when we serve an audience that is uh, uh, fairly youthful, 78% of them are either at age 35 and below, fairly well connected, many of them don't even rely at all on tra traditional platforms for their information. We have to provide a different value to them. And for me, that value comes in three things. The first one is that the kind of reporting we must do now is what one would call critical reportage. That I may be a reporter, but when I go out there to collect and gather news, I must do more than just being a conveyor belt of what pronouncements or what happenings out there. There has to be critical input that I add into that reportage out of my intellectual depth. The second thing is that without fact-checking, we haven't done our job. The job is not complete. Because in this post-truth age, everybody wants to believe that they're entitled to their own facts. But that's not true. It is our duty, then, to find the facts and to share that with our, with our audiences. The third, probably more important, is essentially to hold those in positions of power to account. There may be people in government, there may be politicians, there may be experts in their own rights, but it remains our duty to make sure that they are executing their role and their mandate to the public in a manner that is essential. But when that is said and done, we have to ask ourselves, is journalism equitable to media? Are these two words synonyms? Or are they slightly separate? Because I think sometimes we, we get confused when we mix the definitions of those two. From where I sit, given the opportunities that have been brought about by digital disruption, the definitions for those two are slightly different. So that media is essentially a business, but journalism remains with a certain commitment to public interest. So that today I may be working at National Media Group, but I don't essentially need NMG to be able to conduct my, my journalism. I think in our midst, Journal and NAMU has demonstrated that in very, very clear and effective ways. That you can still be able to do impactful journalism without being part of an, a media entity. The second main point I'd like to make is uh, to go to the whole question around business models. Many of us entered journalism when the business model was settled. It was that independent journalism was paid for through advertising. That because we do a good job of the journalism, we'll aggregate some audience that an advertiser will be interested in and be willing to pay for. Today, we have Mr. Zuckerberg with his Facebook, we have Google, we have Yahoo, and many others who are essentially doing the same thing. They're aggregating audiences and selling those audiences to advertisers in a much, much, much more effective and efficient manner. Most of our media houses are unable to compete. So the question then becomes, 
how then do we pay for independent journalism today? I want to go back to where it all starts. How, how do we train journalists to enable them to be able to confront that question? Because businessmen are not going to help us to define new business models. Because they, they have not a clue the values that we live by. Journalists have to do that job. So the, 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 the skills in counting sense, the skill in money, managing money, a time has come when that important skill must be part of our journalism school and must be part of our journalism training to enable us to get the, the capacity to deal with that, to confront that issue. Various uh, business models have been explored. Some of them are asking audiences to pay their way into journalism. Others are looking for philanthropy. None so far has proved foolproof. Indeed, in the entire space of uh, innovation in journalism, the only entity I know of that is reporting any success is the New York Times. But when you look at what the New York, New York Times is doing, you might think that they're succeeding because of their investment in digital. But if you look at it keenly, you'll find that most, for the most part, they're succeeding because they've gone back to the fundamentals of critical reportage. And that leads me to the third point, the question of the whole question of trust on media. Most of the audiences of the New York Times trust that what the New York Times is telling them is critical and is the truth. And for that reason, they feel invested in the success of that entity. It seems to me, therefore, that even us, a big chunk of that question, a big chunk of that work, will go in our going back to the fundamentals of independent journalism. I leave it at that point by making the whole question or point that today our media entities, at least those, of, those who own publishing platforms, are regulated and managed the same way others regulate and manage beer makers or shop manufacturers. Yet, if you look at our constitution, there's a huge, huge public interest mandate that these media entities come with. I think a time has come when that whole space, that whole regulatory space needs to be redefined so that, so that when media houses come back to give their annual reports in terms of their performance, there has to be a part of that report that speaks to just how well or how badly they did in delivering the public interest question. I thank you. Thank you, Churchill. Churchill has made a distinction between media and journalism. That is the business and there's a professional practice and is rooted for professional practice, which in this day and age, he says, would end up bringing trust and in the long run, bring money. Thank you very much. So, Madam Pierce, the panelist, I wish to thank you very much for this session. So I want to move to the next level to open up the conversation to the participants. So I want to ask um, the audience that will be having at least 30 minutes to go through this. I hope that's right, uh, Dr. Ranga. And um, I'll be sending out uh, microphones. So you want to ask questions about the subject, media sustainability, viability. What are the new paths that we, we can uh, pursue? So, what we'll do, we'll take at least the first uh, five. So, I'll start with Dr. Ranga, and you'll tell us your name, and then the question, and then you don't start by thanking the speakers, just go straight to the question. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. My name is Oranga. I'm actually the MC of the event. I've, I didn't want to ask any questions, but I've been each because I am an academic with my sister here. 
I wanted to ask Rosemary that I think we need to be very careful with the researches that we conduct. Uh, there was something here about the media, the print media becoming extinct in the USA by 2017. Yet I know that America today is selling a million copies today, 2018. Okay, so I just want perhaps clarity on that discrepancy. But most importantly, let me tell you three quick stories. I'll take only one minute. One, in the 1920s, when the radio came, it hit the world by storm. People were so excited about the radio. Then in the 1950s, TV came. And many researchers conducted this kind of study saying the radio will die within 10 years. Because now, a better technology has come that gives you sound, but also pictures. Here we are, 80 years later, the radio is still there. I dare say, it will take a longer time, I think, for the print media to die, but that's a story for another day. Perhaps you can just respond to that. Number two, there is a belief that as the world becomes more inclined to technology, people discard perhaps traditional methods of consuming information. In a university in this country, where I go as a visiting lecturer, a few years ago, they are always given a yearbook, you know, this thing called a yearbook. The university decided, since most of our students are tech-savvy tech, tech and the world is becoming more technological, this year we won't give you a yearbook. We will give you a year DVD. For the first time in that university, there was almost a strike. So I just want to mention that as an academic, I appreciate research, I appreciate data, but I think sometimes we should be very careful in terms of the predictions we make with respect to certain audience behavior. Human gratification is a very interesting thing altogether. You may not understand why somebody prefers to read a newspaper than hold an iPad like uh, my sister Lona is holding. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Ranga. Um, I'll go uh, uh, behind, then I'll come here. Um, okay, B before you, I'll say one, two, three, four, five, six, in that order. Good afternoon, my name is Edward Wanyonyi from uh, Communications and uh, Media Manager with the uh, Oxfam Pan-Africa Program. And I'm just concerned with the sentiments that have also been made with the panelists, especially in regard to sustainability. Uh, Rosemary alluded to the fact that Netflix is selling quite a lot and making a profit, but uh, you never touched also on the regulatory regime that, is in, that next Netflix is operating in, that there will be no shutdown per se when a political season comes. That is something which we need to consider, that even as we are talking about the kind of digital innovations we are setting out there, what is a regulatory regime that is happening? Is it a regime that gets a bit of uh, convulsions when an election period comes? The second thing also is concerned with the whole idea of training. We, we talk about universities have to train, but who is going to underwrite the bill of those curriculums? Who is going to be actually in charge of ensuring that we challenge uh, the kind of innovative curriculums when the Ministry of Education is trying to say that standardize the curriculums and ensure that uh, curriculums will actually be in one mass to, to, to almost seem that we are going to have one Bible for journalism when we know that there is need for innovation and creative, uh, creativity in terms of the kind of lessons and uh, the content that we have. So who is going to underwrite that cost? And are we also looking at uh, changing even the, the people who are sitting at the Commission of University Education? Most of them, we know the time they went to school. Are they reflecting the current system? Thank you. Okay, and given the order, let's proceed. Okay, um, my name is Francis. Um, uh, in, the, in the question of sustainability and viability, um, I still believe that uh, in terms of content development, there's a lot that is still required, and I, I can still say that the market is still so huge. Uh, there's a lot of companies that are coming up that wants commercials and, 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 and the likes. So I believe we, we as, as a media industry, just need to go down to the drawing board and strategize on, uh, on how then do we uh, package up, uh, you know, uh, services. And, 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 and of course, now, just make sure that, that we are now rolling it out in a, in a more systemized way in terms of uh, just making it more valuable towards getting, uh, you know, more, more work. But I, I still believe there's a lot 
that is still required within the, the, the industry and, and the market is so broad that you cannot exhaust. My name is Samai and I'll direct my question to P.S. Helsi. Uh, based on the discussions we've had here, all facts allude to one conclusion that eventually perhaps this competition and the business models might leave us with very few private media organizations. I want to ask the CS, how is the government preparing KBC to remain a trustworthy and reliable source of information to the public? And also, how come for all the years that we've been in this industry, it seems KBC is not competitive enough, despite the fact that it's being run by taxpayers' money? How come you're not able to keep competitive reporters and compete in a fair, fair game like the private institutions? Thank you. Thank you. My name is Eddie Nadwa. And my question will go to Churchill and Rosemary. Rosemary spoke about digital disruption. On the other hand, uh, Charles spoke more about journalists being uh, committed to what he calls critical reportage. However, with the advent of social media, uh, news is first broken in the social media. Then the other traditional media follow. So there's normally this rush. Each media house wants to be the first to break the news. So in, in the advent of being the first to break the news, you, you lose some facts, and you, you never get to give out the full facts when you break the news. How do the now traditional media like TV uh, bridge that gap? Then secondly, about critical reportage and about uh, journalists not just being conveyor belt of he said, he said, or they are saying. Uh, uh, with a case of example of about the Cuban doctors, how do you expect like a journalist who doesn't understand uh, in detail about uh, matters about health, to give you an extra uh, information on health. Uh, uh, this will call for training maybe on journalists about these other issues on health. So whose role will it be? Is it for the media council or is it the responsibility of the media owners to, to empower these journalists further in terms of uh, building their capacity and knowledge on various fields? Just a short one. I just want to touch on what Churchill Otieno had talked about. There's a critically gap in this country in terms of like Anyang Nyongo had actually talked about it before. There is some journalism that portrays critical thinking. That is think tank journalism that thinks about policies and issues, scientific issues, agriculture, what we talked here yesterday. Uh, it's not selling so much, but it's very, very important because it shapes the destiny and the thinking capacity of a country. It might not be viable for advertisers because there is not mass journalism. Where do you put that? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, okay, I will give uh, the two hands this side, then you come to the panelist. Thank you, my name is Karanja. Um, one of the panelists uh, implied that uh, maybe some of our journalists will be quick to go to conferences and seminars uh, instead of maybe running uh, tangible issues. And I'm, uh, I'm alluding to something I read somewhere that uh, the rumbling of the stomach makes the ear deaf to reason. So. Uh, this, student, this journalist is uh, hungry per se, or maybe he's not getting good stipends from where he's working, or he, where she's also working. Uh, and then there's an opportunity at a conference or a seminar, versus going to a place in Pondamali in Nakuru and finding a story about a woman who is growing cabbages on a gunia. So uh, I think the journalist will maybe prefer to go to this conference, get this stipend ahead of going to this other place. So uh, I don't think it is more or less uh, a question of uh, practice, but maybe training. Uh, and also the, 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 the rule of life. I need to eat at the end of the day. If my organization is not paying me quite enough, 
then I think I'll just go to that CS and listen to her. Thank you. Uh, the last two speakers, please, your names. You didn't give us your name, and my other brother here. My name is Joseph uh, from Heartbeat. I have a question that uh, goes to Mr. Francis Wangosi in regards to the frequency allocations. In the year 2015, we visited CAK. We were requesting for a frequency distribution in Nairobi, but we were told Nairobi is full. That's exactly what we were told. Two years down the line, uh, four radio stations have come up and there have been allocated frequencies in Nairobi. That is NRG located, uh, uh, owned by Kevin Mulay, 1FM, which was initially owned by Enrio Tiende and transferred to the son of uh, former minister Henry Consgay. Kosgei, sorry. And then uh, we have Kubamba that is owned by Kambo and our team. And then we have Quit Radio that is owned by Vincent Atea. Now I would like to ask uh, Mr. Wangusi if uh, the young generation who are journalists and have the background in journalism and they want to bring some content into the industry. And then uh, when they visit your office, per perhaps you normally tell them that it's full. And then a few years or months down the line, there is another station that is using the same frequency suggestion they did. Uh, could you kindly clarify to us the method and the procedure so that next time we do exactly what these other people are doing to get the frequencies? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Joseph. Uh, uh, Joseph, we have engineer Boret here. Uh, not engineer Wangusi, but he'll study for engineer Wangusi. So, um, since uh, PS had started earlier, I want to give her the first chance to respond to some of the questions raised. For example, um, the public broadcaster and um, the others that were raised in regard to policy and national government issues. Madam. Thank you. Um, I believe Edward Wanyoni of Oxfam had uh, some comments about training. Um, what I can say about training is that training is uh, done, especially for the people who actually do most of the work, uh, is done in tertiary organizations. And I think the government is very keen on TIVET training uh, right now. At the ministry, we have KIMC, as you know, the Kenya Institute of Mass Communication, that has trained a lot of the people who work in the media houses today and have risen through the ranks after going to university to get their degrees, but their first uh, point of training was probably at KIMC. Um, you talked about innovative curriculums, and I agree with you. Um, Talent-based courses, uh, the people behind the camera, the people who do the scripting, the people who do, there are people who are talented, not everybody. Chachi Lotieno was, was good in digital, and Nation you know, uh, realized that and gave him that desk when they started to go digital. But there are many other people that produce the content that are very talented, but may not have the necessary educational background. I'll give an example of the Kenya Film School, which falls under the Department of Film Services at the Ministry. It's a talent-based uh, uh, school. Um, they train uh, a few people, just 25 uh, in a year. And they take even standard eight dropouts, you know, standard eight only, form four. And uh, they were telling me that there's a standard eight dropout who was trained as a camera person and he's excellent, he was top of his class and now everybody's asking for him when it comes to talent uh, uh, train, um, uh, whatever, the services that they need. If he went to Strathmore where, where Rosemary works, he wouldn't have a chance. He would never get that chance. And there are a lot of people out there who are being given opportunities through uh, such uh, training. Because the training is 70% practical, just 30% theory. You don't need a school, and it helps the underprivileged get opportunities to get trained and to be the best. So I think we need to think more about how to make the training more valuable and to get the people that need that kind of training. And perhaps the media houses can chip in and, and, and do as part of their CSR, train talents that they cannot um, uh, get uh, from universities or, or, or higher colleges. 
into similar uh, organizations that give that opportunity. So TIVET is, is something that is very, uh, I think is a way to go in terms of training a majority of uh, our students. Kenya has been very focused on university training. A lot of people, everybody aims to go to university, but not everybody who goes to university gets a job. There are millions of young people out there without jobs. Yeah, with their degree certificate. So I think we, it's, it's just a mindset change and I think the government's focus on TIVET is going to help that. I worked, I worked uh, in, in Switzerland where after f high school, the kids, uh, they go for a one year compulsory military training. And then after that, they go and, and train as plumbers, they go and train as tra train drivers, uh, home caregivers, hospital technicians. And nobody in Switzerland is jobless. They don't need to bring in uh, labor from any other country. And I think America is also beginning to think about doing um, that kind of training. And I think Kenya also, with the TIVET, is thinking that is where we can uh, help our youth get uh, better training and better opportunities. So my, you talked about KBC. Um, I'm only in the ministry two and a half weeks. This is my third week, actually, that's ending. But KBC is something that we will focus on, for sure. Uh, we want to make KBC, it, it is the oldest, I think, media house in the country. Um, it's been government-owned, government-funded all this time, uh, with partnerships from uh, helpful uh, people. Uh, it doesn't have the kind of money that NMG has, or, or Standard Media Group, it doesn't. Uh, because uh, these people, their, their partners are rich people, <laughs> people who have the funding. And Exchequer has to think about all the other needs of the citizens of Kenya. So when we invest in KBC, it just gets the, you know, what it needs to get um, uh, to, to continue working. But we're looking at uh, um, how to turn that around, I think, because they bought equipment many years ago. They're, they're just in that analog to digital migration right now. We've invested a lot in that. And when it's fully digital, then you know we will be able to uh, make even more changes. Um, KBC is the one that's countrywide. It reaches people where um, the other media houses don't go because obviously they're thinking about the profits, but we are thinking about uh, making sure that the population has the information that they need. Uh, so, and as a government, we cannot be unfair you know, we have to give equal play field to everyone. Uh, so we will not monopolize their try to force uh, KBC by giving them undue advantage, isn't it? So we will we'll try and we will continue. And I, I can assure you that hopefully in the next few years, you'll see changes at, at KBC. Lastly, Karanja talked about, because I mentioned about journalists attending. Um, this, there is the hungry journalist and then there's the lazy journalist. You know, it's easier to come to a conference and a seminar and get the speeches or a few stories and, and take that to the editors. Uh, my, uh, I would like to encourage uh, the media houses to take care of their staff uh, more. Um, it's, it's always difficult, transport, lunch, analysis, stipends. But I remember that uh, when I was at the Nation Media Group, um, there are people who used to want to use some of the journalists to do some other things as, you know, so they get more money. For instance, I remember, I don't know if you remember the HAPIC, the toilet, uh, the HAPIC uh, advert, you know, the toilet. Eh? So there's a journalist they had picked and they wanted him to do that advert and we told him, no, you will be diluting the brand of the organization, Nation Media Group, because this journalist who's respected is busy cleaning toilets. And then, now when you go to read the news, who will believe you? You see? Uh, so it's, it's just that you have to look at brand equity and some of those other issues when uh, you're doing this job. So I, I, I hope that uh, I've answered your question. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you, Madam Pierce. Um, let me ask Engineer Boret to dis uh, respond to the question frequencies. Okay, th thank you very much. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, I just wanted to comment also on somebody talked of Netflix uh, that they are not uh, investing. Uh, what I want to say is, uh, okay, when you look at the statistics, Netflix 
they actually spent 6.5 billion last year just to develop content. USD now, you're talking of USD. Amazon, 4.5 billion. And when you look at the traditional, like uh, Walt Disney, they are talking of between seven to 10 billion. So you can see they are really investing. The only thing now is uh, what do we get as the country? And those are some of the questions we are looking at. As a ministry and the government, we, we want to see whether we can get a piece of the pie or even if we don't, we, we, we control at least the content in a way. So, so that's an area we are still thinking about. So, so I wanted to really to challenge broadcasters that it's not for nothing that people are going for Netflix. You got to invest in uh, content that is uh, captivating and inspiring. Then I also wanted to comment on research. Research, I know uh, Rosemary will be commenting. I want to agree with Dr. Oranga really because I've got some other research also that says that uh, on average print media is remained flat actually. It's remained flat. It's, uh, it's remained flat. That's worldwide now, of course. But for the growth has been in the online. Like the average media use of media per person per day from the year 2015 to 2018, it increased from eight hours to 9.73 hours. But uh, the growth has been in online. Online increased from uh, 2.7 to 3.69. Linear TV re reduced a bit, 3.78 to 3.63. Radio, almost the same, 1.67 to 1.73 print 0.68 to 0.68. So you can see there's a lot of contradictory. So I, I, I agree with the idea of, and I think we also need to invest in our own data. I think that's really maybe another point. Uh, that's a challenge to, to the media. Then the other, just now to go to my questions, uh, maybe also just to comment on KBC also, I agree. There are many challenges, as PS said, government has got priorities. But the space for public broadcaster will always be there. It can never be filled by the commercial or, or the community broadcasting. So let me go to the question that was, I was asked by Joseph for Artbeat. Uh, frequency is a scarce resource. That's what I want to say. And uh, FM really is just within a, a very small stretch. For Nairobi, you're talking of uh, about 40 to 50, depending on the separation. And uh, what has been happening now is because of these challenges of, of business, businesses are getting reorganized, they are being acquired. So, so what you are seeing, new stations coming, people are rebranding themselves, they are acquiring, they are merging. Uh, so that's what is happening. The other thing you need to understand is this industry was not regulated before. In fact, the thing we only used to do at CA was to assign frequencies, just check the power. But now from 2009, the law gave us the mandate. But you are not also able to implement this until we had a case on digital migration. And that case helped us to be declared as being possible to, to deal with content issues. And that's when we started licensing uh, uh, broadcasters. So at CA now, our main priority really is to formalize the existing players uh, into the licensing regime. It's a pro process we started actually last year because we have been busy formalizing the TV, which we have done. Now we are on FM. And our strategy is once we conclude that process, then we will need to do an audit and see whether there are frequencies in some other places. But a place like Nairobi certainly it will not be there. But, but really, there are opportunities. I know it's not immediate. You can still develop your content online. Online is available. So that you never know, technologies can change and there will be opportunities for you. So th there's no, I mean, the alternatives for you, you may not get exactly what you wanted in terms of FM but you can get alternatives in terms of developing content. Okay. 
Thank you. I'll now ask Rosemary to respond to issues about research and also university training okay. and other issues that were raised uh, on your presentation. Rosemary. Um, I'm glad that the research question is raising uh, a lot of uh, positive or negative uh, response. But this is where we need to uh, ask ourselves as a country, how does research fit into the kind of work we do? That research was done in 20, in fact, I brought it intentionally. It was done in 2015. You remember when they said New York Times was going to close? And all the newspapers in America had to look at that research and say, we need to re-strategize. How are we going to target our audience? How are we going to be able to um, engage with them? What kind of news do they need? So New York stopped just general uh, uh, publishing and became targeted newspaper that knew who are their audience and what's their interest. So even the issues they were publishing became different. So the research can inform us to be able to know that it's not business as usual. And that's why when uh, you will see people standing along the roadside selling you newspaper when you're passing, and you're just passing by, even if you're giving newspaper, new, uh, free newspaper, we don't take it, there's need to be research to inform our work. And uh, as academia, we say time has come for academia and uh, market, and even um, the professional to come together and work. Because I know within the university, the postgraduate uh, research, this work that has been done about the status of the media in this country, as any newspaper used it, even to inform and to reorganize. And that's why I'm saying we don't, let's not dismiss research as a fact of it, because companies have grown as a result of research. Coca-Cola itself, when they needed to actually make sure that they are sold in every corner of this globe, they did research and they found out that the housewife they have been ignoring is actually a critical target. Because when a mother goes to the supermarket with a with child, the mother will say, I want a, a Coca-Cola, and the mother will buy. And they found out with that, their, their prices increased. New York Times told me the same, that they had to reorganize. They are using data journalism, but they knew through data who their target audience is. So data is the soil in which everything is growing at the moment. That actually is disrupting the way we think. Data is actually making us see the gaps that we never used to take for granted. And that's when we talk data disrupting, even our story, the way we tell our story, is not going to be a viable story if it doesn't have facts and figures to give, validate the kind of story we are talking about. And um, training. Having been at the university, I realized that there is no actually, um, what do you call it, curriculum around universities like who are doing university training that actually gauge what kind of training we do. At Strathmore, we are now trying to introduce a master's in data journalism, not data, data science with speciality in journalism. And the process of getting that curriculum to be actually passed by the Committee on University Education is kind of tremendous. It takes, in fact, you are lucky if it's passed through one year. And yet we talk innovation is passing through, you know, every single day. But before you reach there, you have to go through the university management to be able to pass it to see is it, you know, academically sound. And one thing I want to say, even Nairobi University postgraduate in journalism, how many of us even have validated if the university training corresponds to the market? that we give you students from our university, do they respond? And this is where we call um, design thinking comes in, that we need to have a session with the industry, say, what kind of products are we producing? Is it able the industry to meet its target and give uh, kind of uh, realize the profits? Because we don't want to bring you people in your newsroom, the people whom the day you give them assignment does not even know how to do an intro, does not know how, how many words, because I was taught 50 words is the maximum you can, used to have an intro. So that kind of things. And going to the question of um, specialized writing. I remember when uh, um, Otulo War came into Nation newspaper and started became the, one, the first science editor. And by that time, HIVS broke out. And information around HIVS was counting. And by that, it was like if you are HIVS uh, victim, nobody should come near you or if you die, you are escorted by the AP to be buried. And he turned that narrative, being 
having been have got masters in actually biochemistry and uh, I think a medical then he did postgraduate in in journalism so he said that specialized journalism can actually work and because of him nation introduced uh, an insight on uh, health page that help actually gave information on things that affect the, the society. So specialized journalism has got a role, especially in now, that people are becoming general, citizen journalism is, is becoming the order of the day. And when you become a special journalism, you, if you build a brand, you build a legacy, and actually you become a, a product that everybody can, be, the way journal Namu know, is known as investigative journalism, we can, be, we can become specialized journalists that have a landmark. And my last comment on the, I think, um, the market being so huge, uh, no, the Netflix. I, when I say Netflix does not invest, I say because Netflix did not have to wait the way they have waited to get the spectrum to actually pay the Kenya government. And yet, most of the Kenya audience watch Netflix. What Netflix realized was the content that they have to invest in it. So online platform is accessible to all of us. And that's a huge market that we can use it positively and negatively. And how we can you be able to turn the Netflix experience to work for us as a nation, to, in order for us to be able to get quality uh, online content that has an impact. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Madam Rosemary. Um, I'll now ask Churchill to respond to, among others, the question on critical reportage. And there was a question that was raised by the gentleman from Oxfam on who should fund curriculum development. And he also raised the question, who should be the curriculum regulator? And he made allusion to the fact that uh, some of the guys sitting at the Commission for University Education are uh, all these who may not know what happens. Any among the panelists can respond to that. Thank you. Churchill first. Um, I think my teacher, Dr. Ranga, spoke about the death of newspapers. Um, just a quick response to that. I don't know when newspapers will die. And I think I'm with him on that corner. Only that that engine is slowing down and slowing down pretty fast. In fact, if you talk to any newspaper manager in Kenya, it's, it's very, very clear that it's slowing down. But it shouldn't be surprising because the composition of the population that we serve, the composition of the audience is slightly different. Yeah, they're younger people, they consume the information in a different way and those new ways might be taking most of them away from the newspaper. As we sit here today, I don't know how many we are, but how many bought a newspaper today? Yeah, I think that says it. Yeah. A boat? Yes, we are talking about sustainability. How many of you bought newspapers? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. My point is made. Um, Eddie spoke about social media and the tendency sometimes for newsrooms to rush to compete social media in terms of breaking the story fast. From where I sit and in many quality newsrooms that I know, the emphasis is always on verification that you do not have a story until you know it for a fact. At that point then, you can, you can rush to break it. Because if you want to break something before verifying it, what essentially are you doing? Yeah, exactly. So for me, there is no competition because the professional journalist never thinks of publishing anything before they have verified it. And that verification becomes, constitutes a big chunk of the value that we then add to, to society, that we then add to our audiences. It is for that reason that many times when, when people see claims of new happenings on social media, 
they quickly turn to the mainstream media to double check. Yes, it means that the mainstream media still does have a healthy amount of trust. Our job, our role, is to maintain and even grow that trust, and we have to be deliberate about it. Uh, you did mention uh, a question around training and basically asked whose responsibility is it. I think the first responsibility must go to the journalist. Yes, because when, when it comes to especially new storytelling formats, there's a host of free training available. It's a question of am I as a journalist seeking that training? so that I can then be guided where to find it. Because remember, you are never ever going to get one set of skills that will help you across the entirety of your career. The game is changing, it's changing every few days, so that that change becomes a new constant. Today, data journalism is in vogue, and many of us are rushing to learn how to visualize data, how to analyze data, and how to tease out insights and stories out of that data. But in another six months, another one year, something else will come along. We need to relearn that again, so that the learning is a new constant that we have to adopt. Uh, Ambito spoke about uh, the, uh, his concern for in-depth journalism, or intellectual journalism as he put it. I think that takes us to the whole question of are there new innovative ways to fund journalism? In my stable, for instance, we have uh, one of our best uh, performing products, the Business Daily. Business Daily is not a mass market product. It's very niche. Now, a good marketer will know how to monetize Business Daily very, very different from how he or she does the Daily Nation, because that platform gives you access to a fairly quality audience, a different kind of a profile in society. There are different ways then that you can generate money out of that same sector. And I think those are the uh, creative ways we then need to, need to get. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to about 20 minutes to one and um, my time was to end at 12.30. So I want to beg your indulgence that we come, we bring this session to an end so that we get to the next session. And before we do that, let me take this singular opportunity to thank Madam Pierce for coming, sitting, and responding to questions. I know of many places and in my earlier days as a reporter, you would only see a PS or a minister coming for official opening and disappearing. Now, I'm happy to see that you're here, sitting and engaging with the audience. I think you also get the feedback from the audience. That's very important and we appreciate that and encourage you to do more of that. Our panelists, Chechi Lutieno, Rosemary, Engineer Boret, I thank you very much for your insights, depth, articulation, brevity and ability to address the questions that came forth. So I'll take this opportunity therefore to bring this session to an end and I also wish now to ask Dr. Ranga to come and take up the session. You can also clap for me. <laughs> and clap for the panelists and Madam Pierce. I hope sincerely that this has made a difference. It has opened up our minds and we can continue this conversation here and after. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let's appreciate that panel a bit more powerfully. <laughs> yes, I'm also glad that the hall appears to be filling up. Actually, my experience in this business has taught me that usually the hall fills up around lunchtime. I think that's a good thing. <laughs> okay. Um, before the closing plenary session, I'll call Dr. Joey Mweni to give a recap of events. And then after that, we'll have the closing plenary. Okay, so Dr. Joy Moha, please. Okay, let's welcome her. Okay, 
Uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I sat at the back with uh, Dr. Joy Mweni, who's still seated there, and um, we tried to just capture the highlights, sort of, of the of the summit that started yesterday. But we also have something that started on uh, Wednesday when we were at the Aga Khan University. So um, I'd just like to read out what um, the glaring issues that came up from sort of each session. So in the morning when we started yesterday, the chair of the council, Media Council of Kenya, Dr. Julius Kinyeki, actually noted that the launching of the 2018-2023 strategic plan is historic because the history of the media development in Kenya uh, will find like a space to be read in the history. And Christine Guku, the Editor's Guild, um, sorry Christine, where, what are you? Secretary? Thank you. Uh, she noted that the media carries, carries voice of policy makers to, and it provides a platform and debates of the feel of the Kenyans. So uh, policy makers should be put to task to help to achieve the Big Four agenda. The PSICT noted that the Media Council of Kenya has taken a bold step in coming up with the strategic plan because failing to plan is planning to fail. So he says that this strategic plan will give the MCK a roadmap on the activities that they're planning to do in the next five years. And the PS State Department of Broadcasting and Telecommunications, Mrs. Fatuma Hirsi Mohammed, um, reaffirmed that the ministries, ministry is committed to support MCK in the strategic plan and declared the annual media summit open and congratulated the MCK for the launch of the strategic plan. So we had a summit plenary, plenary session where the discussion was media and sustainable national development, the big four agenda. Professor Levi Obonio told us that media, media industries have ignored the development of creative content required to encourage growth of sciences. Mr. Mudaura Paul said that media needs to improve the messages sent out by avoiding sensitive messages that discourage investors. Mr. David Omoyo, uh, speaking on fake news, said that failure by government to provide information that journalists need has led to the speculation and reporting of rumors by journalists. So he suggested that the government should provide sufficient information about Agenda 4 for journalists to cover the subject intensively and appropriately. So we had a discussion in the panel on media's role in environment and food security, where the panelists were addressing challenges and embracing opportunities. Honorable Dr. Pamela Odiambo stated that there's a glaring political goodwill as set in the government's big four agenda. The government has declared food security as its big agenda. And she, uh, she says that the media should act as advocates and creators of information on livelihood systems and gaps in the food value chain. The panel on media gender mainstreaming noted that in covering the gender agenda, um, the media have to move, or rather we just as audiences or whoever, have to move from the us versus the de them ideology. And then there's the issue of tokenism, that's a practice that is now becoming entrenched in media spaces in the society. Women should be seen as qualified as they are. Um, we spoke in the business agenda um, se uh, session where Anzomo Mutuku um, noted that there is an investment in the big four agenda directly through the capital markets. And he also highlighted that eight out of 10 Kenyans do not have adequate retirements. And Mr. Ocheng Rapuro, Rapuro said, uh, information to the public, it's the, our duty to inform on opportunities that exist in all sectors, as we also monitor and evaluate the trends. So this morning, we, there was a panel on safety and protection of journalists, 
and the challenges of online content regulation in Kenya, where uh, the panel noted that journalists endure psychological trauma caused by online threats, physical attacks, and delayed salaries. Some county assemblies are denying journalists the right to do their work, and this affects the journalists, and some are not even using their bylines. And so uh, for the big four agenda to be achieved, the panel notes that security need to be assured as economic development goes hand in hand with the security. The, the, yeah, with sec security. So just a few of the summit recommendations is that uh, we need to do training on how to ensure that the youth thrive online and the government has to to spread enough financial resources for the media coverage of the Big Four agenda, the government to provide enough information on policies touching the Big Four agenda, media should stop the sensitized reporting that focuses on failure and challenges facing the government, the media should give context to the failures of the government and prominence to the achievements made by the government, and also the media should publish balanced and fair information about government activities. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Ari. Let's appreciate the rapporteurs one more time. Okay. Adalia said that after this, we'll have a closing plenary session. Let me correct that. We'll not have an actual plenary. We are out of time. But should you have any more additions, questions to ask, please continue the discussion you know, in the Twitter handle, in the virtual realm that we've availed to you as far as this conference is concerned, okay? I'll now call the CEO. Please join me in welcoming with a round of applause the CEO of the Media Council of Kenya <laughs> to preside over the closing session, okay? Buona see you. Um, I wanted to say good afternoon or good before lunch because usually we have a good after lunch but I realize that people are fairly hungry and we may not afford to talk too much we will allow them. I, as part of the plenary we are going to be projecting our email address here for feedback. We really appreciate they are going to be projected in a while. We appreciate feedback about areas you thought we should improve because our intention is to have this summit annually. So please uh, give us feedback about what areas you think we can improve so that we can have more of these deliberations and specifically matters to follow up. So on behalf of uh, the council, the secretariat, I really thank each and every one of you for creating time to join us. We have had uh, two days of serious brain work discussing about the media. We have a lot of the discussions here and online. I noticed that last night, for those of you who love going online, we were trending at number two at some point last night under the hashtag Media Summit KE. And so we really appreciate that we've had a chance to bring together academia, the media owners, the editors and all that to deliberate about the challenges facing the industry. Uh, I know those of, some of you are joining us tonight for the gala dinner and the Journalist of the Year Award. And that's why we've chosen to end this early so that people can go home and put on their dinner dresses and dinner suits and bow ties so that we can join here and appreciate the best that journalism has had to offer. Uh, without further ado, I want to welcome the chair, Dr. Julius Kinyeki, to say only one word so that we can be able to allow those who are traveling home and those who are waiting for the evening to go take a break so that we can proceed. So, asanteni sana and you are welcome again. Please send us your feedback on the emails on the screen and we promise that we will get back to you. Asante. Thank you very much, Buana CEO. He has given me permission to say the one word in one paragraph. Many years ago, as First year as a graduate student, my lecturer gave me the definition of communication as sending and receiving messages, either verbal or nonverbal, through a medium. 
And I don't know whether that definition still stands. Perhaps uh, Dr. Nancy Buka, the definition does it still stand? Sending and uh, receiving messages, either verbal or non-verbal, through a medium. To a larger extent. extent, thank you. So I was a good student. And at the same time, <laughs> At the same time, the same semester, we went ahead and studied the barriers to communication. And my hope today is there has no been any barriers to communication from yesterday to today. Uh, from your body language, I can tell that you are either a sender or a receiver of what has been taught today. <laughs> But very much later in my postgraduate studies, I was taught that you must be very critical and analytical of what you've been told. I'm challenging you today that don't just take what you've been told or observed. Be critical and be very analytical so that this debate can move forward. My I was asked to come and just say just one word. I want to just give a vote of thanks. And may I start by thanking the Almighty God for his faithfulness, for the success of this summit. And specifically, again, I want to thank sincerely our two PSs, Madam Fatuma Hisi and uh, Jerome Ochieng, Director of uh, Presidential Delivery Unit. Zoka Muita, uh, council members, commissioners, MCK secretariat, um, and also yesterday I asked you to shake hand with the person next to you and you agreed that you are stakeholders. Kindly check for me whether the stakeholder is still there. Thank you. If I left your name out, it's not by design. Uh, Kaidre feel very appreciated, and we welcome you later in the evening for the gala dinner. May I ask at this point, Reverend Inovu to come and say a word of prayer. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Chan. Um, thank you very much. I think we have sat for a long time. We can be upstanding. Um, Dr. Kinyaki has, has reiterated that in his uh, post graduate studies, learned that you need to be analytical and critical. Um, my, my, my Bible tells me of one thing that I want to class with, and this is Second Timothy chapter 2, verse to uh, tells us for the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many and trust to liable men and women I'm adding women uh, so that for those who can be able to teach others what we have learned actually is not for this room it's for the whole country kindly disseminate this information so that uh, Next time we have many people and the knowledge has widely traveled. May the Lord bless us. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we thank you this evening or this afternoon for your love. And now we have had sat here for two days. We are now closing this session on discussion. We have had quite a lot that we are taking home. And so, Lord, we know it has taken your mercy and your grace. Because by the time we began, we know many people have gone to hospital and others do not know where they are. And now, as people, the few we are who can feel ourselves and who can go up and down, it's not because we are any good, but because you love us and you are purposed us to have the information that we had. How we pray that as we go out, we go at one and we go with one mind, 
that we want to build this industry and that this industry as it stands cannot be avoided in, in any way while the government and any other sector would want to de disseminate their information. Help us to understand this and to take caution on everything that they do. Father bless us and keep us. Now the peace of the Lord that passes all man's understanding may rest with each one of you. And the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you, remain with you, walk with you in your homes, in your places of work, now and always. Amen. Thank you very much. Welcome to lunch. Welcome to the gala and see you again next year.